Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Lot Roots podcast. And you're joined by myself, Ronnie Smith. Today, I have a special guest, my friend Boris Plotkin. And Boris is someone that I have met a number of times, usually at fruit festivals. And I met him at the Canada Fruit Fest. Um, I don't know if it was 2019 or 2018, but going back a few years. And I'm aware that Boris originally, I believe, was born in Israel, I believe. And then Belarus. was Bel sorry, was it Belarus? I grew up in Israel. Yeah. Oh, you did go to you were in Israel at one point. But eventually, well, well, we'll hear more from you about your actual story. Uh, eventually ended up in Canada. And um, he's now living over in Ecuador and has land as part of the Fruit Haven Eco Village. And he's growing some of his own fruit out there and has an amazing house which he's not at right now has an amazing spot and he has his own shower behind which is his own uh, waterfall which is amazing so um boris it was a it was good to be able to visit you out there recently uh, is there anything else you want to tell us about yourself as an introduction to you there's a there's obviously a lot there that i've missed out uh, well, yeah, I guess so. I, I was born in Belarus, and then as a baby, uh, my entire family moved to Israel, uh, where I grew up for about 10 years, and then after that in Canada, but um, still I have a lot of family in Israel. So, and then after, yeah, I grew up a bit more in Canada, then I was traveling and I visited, I think, around 20 countries in my last count. And then uh, after some years, yeah, basically became into fruits as I started traveling. And then uh, I wanted to find more like-minded people. And that's when I first went, yeah, I think it was 2018 for the fruit festival at, um, in Canada in British Columbia with Ted Carr. And that's when we met, I remember. And then uh, that was my first fruit festival. And after that, uh, I went to Fruit Haven here at the end of the year. So that was the first time I came, so 2018 at the end of the year. And then uh, I went traveling the next summer as well. So I went to the uh, Woodstock Fruit Festival where we met 2019. And, right, uh, yeah. And then I came back here and basically I, I haven't left since because then the, the COVID restrictions started and I thought what better place to be than to build a cabin here so great so so Boris um your upbringing was it conventional kind of an, adult, an upbringing what did you eat growing up what was your lifestyle like what were the you know activities education things like that thank you both said so by now I cannot hear you maybe you can hear me but Maybe let's pause it a second. Okay, Boris, what was your upbringing like? Was it a typical upbringing in terms of how you ate, uh, you know, the food you ate and activities and stuff, or was it alternative at all? I think there's quite a healthy upbringing. My mom is a doctor and she's uh, always had some inclination into uh, natural medicine although she didn't get into it until uh, recent years. In the beginning, she was just overall drawn to that kind of ideas. And uh, yeah, I remember that the food she was making was always healthy uh, or on the healthier side, you know, very um, plant-based uh, with some, you know, whatever other things, but uh, not, not vegan at that time, but um, yeah, I remember that uh, she always encouraged us to eat like the healthier whole plants and fruits and and uh, not candy and things like that. That's what I liked, which later I, I realized that that's what I wanted is uh, good quality fruits. <laughs> so from a young age, you liked the fruits? At uh, that time, I didn't like it so much because it wasn't the highest quality fruit. And uh, right. my mom was also remembering, oh, you didn't really like the fruits and I was remembering well because uh, they weren't like that good, they weren't ripe, they weren't the best quality fruit, even though there is a good selection of them, but it still takes some skill to understand like when it's ripe and how to eat it and how to pick it. And mm. 
And why did you start making changes to your diet? Uh, main reason it resonated with me because I was always drawn to a more natural lifestyle and this seemed like the most natural you could get that's the most uh, in line with nature is like we're frugivores we just collect the fruits from nature and eat them and um, now we cultivate them to get the best quality fruits uh, so yeah that's that's one of the reasons the other reason is at that time I was traveling and I thought the best way that I could travel and stay healthy and no matter which country I go to is just eating fruit and every single country I've been to there's fruit <laughs> there's not one place that I couldn't find it and sometimes it might be harder than others but it's like people you know humans are frugivores and so they're always going to have fruit somewhere you just know where it is and uh, and that was the healthiest way to travel because people can easily get sick you know in India those kinds of places where I traveled constantly having digestion problems and uh, when I was eating fruit it was like fine there was definitely no problems there's no contamination so how did you actually find out the information about change you know eat more of a fruit-based diet or did you go vegan first and what 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 was that uh, process like for you yeah, it was actually um, not through veganism at all. I was uh, I was maybe eating plants primarily, but I never focused on vegetarian or, or vegan. Because um, yeah, I didn't really like vegetables as much. And so uh, my brother told me about Dr. Moore's and actually Ted Carr was one of the um, first uh, YouTubers that I was following at that time. And so I resonated with their messages of eating the whole plants and, and fruits specifically and because they're sweet and we're drawn to sweet things and then I started remembering as a kid I always loved sweet cakes and cookies and whatever you know uh, candies and actually it was not uh, that that is natural for us because those are man-made things and so uh, fruit is the the real cake and candy and all that you know everything else is just imitating so yeah, when I learned about those people and what they, the message that they said that really resonated and, and I, I started following that diet. I did transition for, for many months. It took some time and, and even I would say like a year until I did some fasting and, and that's when I, it helped me go into eating like maybe a primarily, uh, I would say probably like 90%, maybe it's about fruits. And how, um, how easy was that for you? What, what, what were the sort of challenges in, in transitioning to that diet? Uh, let's see, the challenges I had at first, it was uh, at some point you had like the cravings and things like that because uh, coming from kind of more any kind of food, although I was focusing on more natural foods, but I was still craving some, some foods, I think. I can't remember exactly, but I think there was things like bread and, and more sweet things. Maybe if it was harder for me to find sweet fruits. Um, so that was that was a bit of a challenge. And then the social aspects, because I noticed that uh, I didn't want to hang out with people that would go to restaurants because I had nothing to eat there. And there was not much for us to discuss in common, uh, at least regarding foods. So sometimes I would sit with them so, or order like a salad or something. but. I still didn't really like the, you know, I don't really like salads as much, uh, although I do eat them once in a while, because uh, yeah, it's also healthy and natural. But uh, yeah, so eventually doing more fasting, I think that's what helped me with transitioning into, uh, into that diet. And how, how would you describe your diet and how, what is a day in the life for you of how you would eat? Uh, yeah, changes. But mostly I try to do uh, kind of longer dry fast. So between, I try to stop eating at night, maybe between uh, seven, eight and in the evening. And then in the morning, I'll try to not have any, uh, anything until maybe uh, something like seven, well, probably eight or nine. Sometimes I can go until 10 or 11 uh, if, uh, yeah, if I'm able to do that. And I like to start the day just juicy fruits. So focus on something like a watermelon or melon, cantaloupe, 
uh, could be mangoes as well. And uh, if it's going to be like a busy day that I won't have too much time, I might even eat something like bananas um, just to give me more sustenance. Like if I'm going to go jungle hiking and in the far off places here that could be like hours of walking. So, yeah. but usually if I'm not doing that, then it'll just be some, uh, some juicy fruits in the, in the earlier part of the day. And then uh, late, a bit later, I'll have kind of denser fruits. It depends on what's in season. So it could include some, yeah, well, bananas are all year, but uh, there's other seasonal fruits, uh, like fattier fruits. And lately, after this festival, I've tried to cut down the fats a bit more, <laughs> just because it was a lot of uh, avocados and things. But uh, now I'm incorporating more of that. So there's a local fatty fruit here called the Gyapu, which is really good, and it's coming into season. Yeah, um, let's talk about that fruit quickly. So, <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, I talked to Charlotte about this quite a lot at the festival, and we talked about oh, yeah. the interview I did with her. And she talked about Iniaku uh, in a way that I never really heard people speak about a fruit before. And she mentioned a lot of stories about it that people would sort of covet it and hide it and hoard it. And uh, that it was particularly amazing flavor. What, yes. what, what can you tell us about Iniaku? Yeah, it's a very delicious. I think the the flavor and the texture are very interesting. It's something different from any other fruit. And uh, also being quite rare, like it only fruits once a year for a short time. Some years it, it doesn't even give much fruits. Um, and yeah, being rare in the whole world, like she mentioned, like there's, this is a specifically Amazonian fruit, which is more specific to this part of Ecuador, there is like some small areas um, of Colombia and Peru. And then I've also seen something on the internet that in Costa Rica, there might be some places where they grow it, but uh, it's very special. So it's hard to cultivate. It's, it takes a long time to grow. It's a hardwood tree. So we plant it and it grows very slowly after like many years, uh, it still hasn't fruited. So, um, that, that's kind of the special the qualities that are very delicious it's like fatty and sort of creamy but uh, more like a, a nut nutty flavor uh, cheesy kind of nacho cheese and um, yeah and it's sought after like the trees that I know that are fruiting I'm, I'm walking around and I can see that some animals been eating them so <laughs> I didn't get there in time so I'm gonna have to visit again and they sell it in the market yeah, yeah, and uh, and she was saying that people would go and buy full bags of it and things like that. They do what? That people would go and buy all of it. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, that, I remember. I just watched uh, your interview with her. Yeah, so there was the one guy that would buy like the entire sack. Yeah, <laughs> but now I'll just buy how many I'll, I'll eat, and it's, uh, at some point it's too much. It's very dense, so. There's only so much of it that one yeah. can eat. <laughs> Sounds pretty special. Well, anyway, um, so getting back to your, your own life, what were the benefits you got? Because it sounds like you're saying that you were drawn towards a fruit diet because of the idea that it was more natural and you got this inclination to go towards that. But what were, did you get any benefits and notice any changes for you when you made that change? Yeah, I think the, the main thing is that my life became easier because now my choices are just uh, choosing like a tasty fruit. I think to me, it was like a relief. I don't have to uh, rely on, um, you know, a kitchen or knowing like what the restaurant makes. Like that's, that's something that kind of gave me a bit more peace of mind that I know I'll, I'll be healthy if I keep eating fruits and uh, um, otherwise, yeah, my body, I think, um, I mean, it's been how many now? About 2016 is when I started. So it's about um, six years. And um, I think, uh, yeah, I've just noticed generally like any, any little cuts and wounds tend to heal a lot faster than they used to. Uh, digestion, sometimes if I had the wrong combination of 
fruits or, or vegetables or something. And, and that was a learning process. And then also the transition and fasting. So that could have some issues, but generally the digestion is very good. And uh, yeah, things like skin and hair and nails are all just very uh, good quality, much better. Like in, when I was a teenager, I used to have acne and it was very difficult to deal with. And um, I even took this medicine called uh, Accutane, which is supposed to be quite uh, bad side effects. Luckily, I didn't have any problems with it, but it helped remove the acne because nothing else. At that time, the doctors didn't tell um, that, oh, it's actually diet. They said like, oh, it could maybe be related to some kind of diet. And so I didn't know for sure. And I didn't actually change. I remember eating pizzas and things like that, that uh, for sure was contributing um, also stress at that time it was high school and you know it was stressful time and sure sure excellent and and you were talking earlier about uh, about traveling and you've been to a lot of places what was that what what inspired you and made you want to travel uh yeah when i was living in canada i was learning uh, sorry i'm being distracted here Okay, I'll just video. So, um, so when I was living in Canada, I was uh, just learning, you know, in school there, and I was getting some experience there, and um, it was great uh, to learn about whatever cultures, because many people come from many places there. And uh, after some time, like I got to, to the point where I I wanted to try traveling, so I traveled some some places myself like in back to israel and then i went to um uh, to greece which was close and then after that i went back to canada and thought that i should do some more traveling and so slowly i built up my confidence level into traveling alone because none of my friends wanted to travel and uh, i was encouraged also by watching some videos there's like a group of backpacker travelers i didn't know about this lifestyle because it, it's not very popular and in Canada. And uh, yeah, so when I tried more of it, I just uh, got into the the idea with like hostels, backpacking and going with like trains and buses and later hitchhiking also in Ireland. That was, uh, that was the first time I, I learned about hitchhiking. The people there are so nice and, and wanted to help and show me around. And um, so that, yeah, basically I learned that I, I can learn a lot more by going to the place, like about the geography. If I've actually been to the place, I'll know the layout of the land much better than if I look at a map and try to memorize like the, the city or the location, like the layout, the, the countries that are around it, and then the culture, learning about the history and the language, and then just having those experiences. So I kind of got this travel bug. So I, I started traveling, I think it was about maybe about two years. So I went to different countries in Europe and then I went to Morocco. And then from there, I hopped over to Asia, Southeast Asia, so Thailand. And that's when I became um, kind of with this idea of the fruit. It was like, okay, I'm, I'm fruitarian, I wanna be. And so I took this idea, like my brother told me about it and the fruit in Thailand is so, so great. And uh, it made sense right away. It was like a logical, um, light bulb just went off saying, yeah, this is what we should be eating. It's so delicious and I can live on that, you know, the mangoes there, which I think you lived on some. Yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, so would you say Thailand's one of the best places you've been for fruit and how would you compare it with Ecuador? Or yeah, it's definitely, definitely one of the best. Yeah, it's probably overall the best place for a traveler because it was very cheap and easy to travel and uh, it was also uh, very good quality fruits and the people there the visitors like the travelers the people that are uh, staying there for a long time like the expats they're very interesting a lot of cool stuff is going on there um yeah the only downside really is that having like long-term visas are difficult um but they're not impossible but residency is probably impossible land ownership is also impossible they don't allow anybody that's not thai to have um, ownership at least not complete ownership they'll allow 
a small amount uh, percentage of ownership. But anyway, so other than that, it was a very, very nice place to visit. And other places, I would say India was interesting as well. It was a lot of cultural learning and the fruit quality was, sometimes it was good, like in the South where it's more tropical, it was better. Um, but in Ecuador, it's, yeah, the climate here is very similar. And so we can produce a lot of fruits that they're being produced in Thailand, but there it's an, on a much bigger scale and it's more like commercially. Um, yeah, and also it seems like the culture there really appreciates fruit, whereas here it's, it's an afterthought, like most of the world, it's kind of like fruit is just a secondary like snack or whatever. It's not like a main yeah. diet. So people are more passionate about fruit in, in Southeast Asia. Um, so here people are getting uh, learning about this as we're telling them, like we're really like fruit. That's our diet. We want to eat it. We want to grow it. So they're starting to do it. But before we came here, they really mainly grow as like plantains and bananas papayas and and that's pretty much it like there's a few yeah there's different seasonal fruits like this in yaku wild fruit and um there's some other like abu and a few other things but they all come in this one season usually so it's like between march and uh, may or something and april maybe and and that's pretty much it the rest of the year you just have bananas and papayas but now they're replanting all these other things. We're going to have fruits all year long. So that's that's our goal. Excellent, excellent. And uh, we're traveling, I believe at one time, I don't know if this is exactly true, but I think you, to some degree, funded part of that traveling because you were working picking fruit at one point in Canada in the summer. Is, is, that, is that right or? Uh, no, I was actually working uh, programming. I was doing remotely. I was web development. I've been doing that even before I started traveling for about, I don't know, seven years or something. I did it from home at first, just living with my parents. And then when I moved out um, uh, for like less than a year before I started traveling, because I noticed it's actually more expensive to live in Canada. So. Um, it became cheaper for me to travel and work online. Uh, and then sometimes I also did like a work exchange where I would help one, one guy in Thailand. He had like a kind of um, guest house. And so I helped him make like a website and things like that. Um, and then I would get like a free accommodation uh, also while still doing other work. So yeah, it was very cheap to be in in Asia, the, the main cost is really just flying over there. So once I'm there, I was usually I would stay there for like half a year or more. I think almost, uh, yeah, it could have been like 10 months or something or nine months, I think I stayed. And then, so that made it a lot cheaper over the course of a year. Sure, excellent, excellent. Um, getting back to the, the, the diet, the lifestyle, um, did you make any major mistakes, do you think? Uh, no, I think I did a decent job at uh, transitioning. Um, the main thing that I wish is that I had known about this when I was a teenager when I had acne. And if I had become fruitarian or maybe a whole plant based or something back then, I would have uh, not had to take these uh, medications that are yeah, probably not very good. Um, but probably by now, I mean, it's been, I don't know how many, probably 15 or more years and it's probably de detoxed. But uh, yeah, I think I'm, now I'm pretty comfortable with this uh, eating like juicy fruits in the morning and then or in the early part of the day and then some of the denser fruits in the evening. Um, yeah, I think that's a good way to do it. Cool, cool. Um is there any big mistakes you see other people making? Uh, sometimes, yeah, I sometimes see that it's hard to say exactly because I'm not sure if they're totally honest about how, what their diet is, but uh, I've seen people here where they get confused about what, what is right, what do sh should they eat? And uh, sometimes they um, think that they're not getting enough from the plant food or they're not detoxing correctly. Sometimes they're 
maybe they're detoxing too quickly. They're just having only juices and no enemas and they're not, uh, their bodies like stirs up all the toxins. And I think the herbs are also important during the fasting. Um, there's a specific protocol that I followed and I think it's, it's a very safe way to do a fast. Um, it's actually called master fast pro, um, system and not to be confused with the master cleanse, which is something different. Um, but anyway, it's a protocol. If someone's interested, they can look it up and, and there's a group on Facebook and it includes these components that I think makes fasting safer and better for the, for the body. So having the juices, um, in this case, it's actually specifically a grape juice and it's pasteurized, but some people prefer maybe a raw juice, but that might still have a strong effect. In any case, uh, it also includes the, the enemas. So now we have uh, Maria here that you met. She's also doing colonic hydrotherapy. So that's a very good way to clean the bowels while juicing and um, also having herbs that will maintain the body, you know, giving some more special powers, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, I've seen people that uh, have issues um, after fasting, they'll actually go into eating like very starchy, dense foods, uh, which is a very wrong way to break a fast. It's, there's a saying, uh, anyone can fast, it takes a wise uh, person to break the fast. And so, yeah, if they break a fast with very heavy food and sometimes animal products, and so it can really screw up the body and, and cause more problems than before starting this fast. Excellent, excellent. So I personally, I've never done enemas or uh, colonics, and it's, it's not something that's really drawn. I'm really drawn to. But um, why do people? Why do you do that? Or what's what's the purpose of it for for you? I think that yeah, while uh, fasting is, is something special that goes on in the body and toxins and things from it could be from diet, like previously, you know, however many years it could have been, uh, twenty or more years of eating um habits that could have had uh, a lot of toxicity could have been processed food or animal products or whatever things that build up and and they get stuck in the bowels or in some other intestines and places that even if they use a colonoscopy thing and they still can't see those things but they can uh, after fasting they can start to come out and it loosens those toxins up and um, using enemas is a very good way to flush it out it's one of the ways uh, there might be other ways, but I think it's good in combination with enemas and or colonics or, um, of course, yeah, things like psyllium husk will help move it as well. So that's actually one of the, the components of the fast, the master fast protocol that I uh, followed. Um, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Um, what would be your advice to other people then, Boris, who are starting off? and want to, uh, you know, follow the kind of approach that you're following? Yeah, I think it depends on the speed that somebody wants to, to go. If you want to go easy and slowly into it, then that's, that's also a good way. Just slowly increasing the fruit. That's kind of how I did it. Just increasing the amount of fruits I did, ate and reducing all the other food until it's almost down to nothing. Um, maybe now it's like once a month, I might have some some cassava yucca or some some kind of plantain something just from the land that i feel connected to but otherwise i usually am raw for like 90 percent of the time um, but also uh, focus on the goals so if you have a goal maybe some people they they want to be 60 percent or 80 percent or maybe just half whatever like for example my mom and uh, dad they're primarily raw, but they still have the kind of raw till four where they'll eat a cooked meal at the end of the day. And uh, at first my mom tried doing more raw, but it was too quick. She couldn't transition because it's been, you know, 60 or whatever years that uh, she's been eating uh, the diet, even if it's a fairly healthy diet, but eating cooked food, the body gets used to that. And so she couldn't handle being 100% raw. But then later she transitioned uh, with also the fasting. And so, yeah, I think knowing what the goal is, like focus on, well, it's okay to have one cooked meal a day, then 
at first she had it in the lunchtime, but she saw that she had problems with digestion. So I suggested this rattle for, um, and she said, now it's much better and it's, it's much improved because the cooked food takes longer to, to digest. So it's better to be left at the end of the day. Excellent, excellent. Um, so let's talk then about you, you, you've been traveling and you've went to the festival, but now you're pretty much based in Ecuador at Fruit Haven. So uh, how did you find out about Fruit Haven? Uh, yeah, so after that festival that I visited, I remember thinking uh, that I wanted to, to find a community basically. And so I just did a search of uh, raw vegan, maybe it was fructarian community. I don't know exactly what I typed, but uh, a bunch of results came up. And so I looked a little bit into, into them. Um, I saw some projects over there in Costa Rica that I've not been to and uh, Hawaii also haven't been to, but I researched them a little bit. And this one came up through Hayden. Uh, I also remember seeing something about the fruit festival. That was the first year that they were having it, it was 2019. So I went at the end of 2018. Um, I was hoping, I think, to volunteer there, but at that time it was a very small festival. But in any case, so I found that and I saw Peter's videos and um, his videos made sense to me. And he looked like a programmer and like his logical mind, the way it worked. Uh, I resonated with that. So. I only was surprised to learn that he's not a programmer when I came here, but he has the skills. He has the logical understanding of that. Sure, sure. He can make websites. Yeah, and what? So you, you wanted to find a community. So what? What really is Fruit Haven? If, if other people are interested in going, what? What? What is it? Who's it for? What well, was more about Fruit Haven that it attracted? No, no, sorry. What, for those who don't know anything about it, what, what is Fruit Haven? Oh. oh, what is Fruit Haven? Yeah, so Fruit Haven is basically a um, community and an eco-village um, where people can buy their own land, plant the fruit trees, or they can live in the smaller community areas that we have. Um, and uh, yeah, it's basically an idea. Everybody will have their own understanding of it to me it's uh yeah just living close to nature planting fruit trees being independent from governments and um yeah being self-sufficient as much as we can mm -hmm. and uh it's uh, a lot of young people there actually a lot of people sort of in their 20s and their 30s there yeah, it tends to attract younger people. At times, we have a lot of young people that are visiting for short times that are uh, volunteering. They just want to travel, learn about something. And yeah, often I'm also surprised and impressed that uh, they're so young and they're already discovered this diet because, yeah, I wish that I knew about it uh, at that age. Um, so yeah, it's very nice to see. They have a lot of young energy, but we also have a good fair bit of older people. So mo I think our median age is probably in like the 30s, but then we have some people that are older in their 60s and um, yeah, there's locals here as well that are ranging in age. And uh, even if they're not like us where they eat primarily fruits or, or raw, they're also pretty healthy just living in nature and they're eating mostly from their land, so. What were the benefits for you of, of living out there and why is Ecuador a good place for uh, this kind of community? Yeah, I think um, probably Peter, somebody discussed it and when I saw his explanations and um, so again, like I mentioned about Thailand, uh, in comparison with Thailand, even though the quality is there is very good, residency is impossible and land ownership is also not possible. So that's where this Ecuador, um, uh, policies are much better uh, where anyone, any foreigner can own land um, in Ecuador and they don't even have to be in Ecuador to buy the land. So maybe the majority of people that buy land uh, or in the past that bought it here, uh, actually they bought it uh, online, like they sent all the information, they went to a local consulate that's near them 
uh, that's Ecuadorian, and then having uh, them purchase the land, they can then, uh, you know, request certain things to be done, like planting fruit trees and building a house. Um, so yeah, and then also the residency is, it's not completely easy or free uh, to do, but uh, after an application process, and most people can find a way to, to make it, there's the two main options is anyone that has a university degree, um, like a bachelor or you know, just any three or four years, I think it depends on the country, they can apply and become a resident. At first, it's a temporary residency for two years and then applying for a permanent one. Uh, and for those that don't have it, there are a few other options. So the investor visa, $40,000 in a bank account. Um, and then we can take this investment out. Uh, and there are some other options as well that, that people have had um, with uh, like rental income, people that have social security, those kinds of things. So Ecuador is uh, fairly open to having people come and stay here, getting residency, owning the land. Foreigners, they're much, I feel more welcome as somebody from outside. Like my parents immigrated uh, two times from, you know, first time from Belarus to Israel. So Israel accepted us very well. And then same in Canada, very accepting to foreigners. And here it's maybe not exactly like that because actually it tends to be that Ecuadorians go to these other countries too, like they go to Canada to work, but then they often come back. So here it's like uh, expats that come and live here as well from the US or Europe or Canada. Sure. And your own piece of land that's, that you've got there, I'm interested in what, how did you choose it? What state was it in when you first got it? And what are your plans for, and what have you done so far working on it and developing it? And what do you want it to look like? Okay, so the land, uh, well, I came here already, the project has started. So Peter and Jason, whoever was here starting the project, um, the communities, they, they were here probably about uh, five years before I came. And uh, when I came here, at first I was just checking it out and volunteering. Um, and I learned about the permaculture techniques. That was something I wanted to know how to do. And uh, later I saw that, yeah, there's an opportunity. There's some lots for sale. And so I chose the Fruit Haven one lot. Um, and at that time it wasn't even marked out. So I went and looked at an area that I would choose. and. And we walked with like uh, some workers that cleared an area. Um, actually, they cleared just the path a bit. Eventually, we came with the topographer, GPS did. And so, yeah, it was basically just a kind of secondary forest and it was kind of depleted soil. Um, there was a couple of these uh, wild fruit trees. Some of them are just uh, weeds and ferns and things like that. So yeah, based on what I learned, um, I started developing a section of it. So at first I was trying to clear it myself and uh, I saw how hard it is because there's a lot of hard wood and chopping it all with the machete takes a lot of effort. So I hired some workers uh, and they helped me clearing it, chainsaw and taking down uh, the brush and the trees and then planting them, uh, fruit trees that I was interested in and also applying the soil amendments, the calcium and fertilizing. And then my plan initially was just to visit, kind of live here half the year and travel the other half. And so when I wasn't here, I was just telling Peter, yeah, every few months, uh, send a few workers and have them clear the weeds and uh, put some more um, fertilizer, like the uh, compost sacks, manure sacks, those kinds of things that amend the soil around the fruit trees. And so that was good. But then uh, when I came back and um, yeah, basically decided to stay. So now I just do it uh, myself I, or I still tell Peter and he'll schedule the workers because he does the scheduling. And then I also like to work with them so that I know that uh, they're doing the way I like it. Um, so yeah, that's basically that. And then for the cabin, uh, that was an idea that I got once I came back. So uh, I decided to stay. So I saw a nice uh, view there. It was also some 
kind of secondary forest and it was a unique spot that goes up the hill and then it flattens for a short space that's big enough basically for this cabin and, and kitchen and bathroom. Um, and it's a challenging place. There the soil is much better. So it just depends on where, where you are. Um, so things I plant there, they grow faster and fruit faster. Uh, but the challenge is that it's a smaller space. It's a bit steeper, quite a bit steeper behind it. So, uh, but having the stream nearby, it's it's a nice place to relax. Yeah, and the we visited uh, as part of the festival. We got to see your place. You have a nice, quite a simple but very nice house there, and a great view. Mm. Really nice spot, and. Um, the building of the house how easy was that how did that happen yeah that was also interesting for me uh have uh, almost no carpentry experience like other than uh grade seven <laughs> or something like that carpentry when i was uh, 14 or something um yes yeah, so i didn't know anything about building houses uh basically yeah i learned it all there and it was really fun to be involved as well so for me i was having workers there and seeing the process. So Peter has more experience. He's done uh, a bunch of different projects. And so I told him what I was interested in and he gave me first an estimate of what he thinks, you know, would cost. And when I was happy with that, uh, he made the design and, um, and hired the workers, you know, uh, scheduled them really for, for that. And uh, yeah, it was fun to, to be a part of it. and. Having experienced this, I'm much more confident in in future projects and seeing like uh, how I would want to build something. So I'm planning some more uh, construction to to be done. Maybe for now, just basic structure for storage uh, of wood, and then in the future, building some more houses and things like that. Excellent, excellent, and it's and it's good. Like you, you kind of mentioned in there that it doesn't take having carpentry skills or whatever like people don't have to maybe worry about not having these kind of skills if they want to try and replicate what you're doing yeah exactly we yeah we don't um require anyone to know anything almost because the skills that we have here we can take a project from just bare land like uh, maria's house and many of the houses they're just uh basically some kind of secondary forest that has some trees and nothing really worth keeping uh, the workers are skilled at taking them down, clearing the brush. Um, and then uh, Peter's got the skills and other workers that are skilled in construction. Uh, and there's like the agricultural uh, work as well. So we know how to amend the soil and in the proper way that things grow really fast, really well. So yeah, the skills are, are here already. And uh, of course, anyone that has those skills are very welcome to come as well. We had some people that are carpenters from Canada that are interested, but I think they changed their minds for, I mean, maybe they had some other things coming up. Um, and people that are into permaculture as well, very welcome to, to join. Uh, but also we're looking for IT people. So I have the IT experience, but I want to balance my time on the computer and time in the garden and the nature. So we're welcoming more people to help us uh, improve our infrastructure. We have our fruit files for all the accounting. So everything is, is uh, transparent. So the owners can see where their money is being spent on what and how. And, and uh, we have an accountant, actually Charlotte helps us with that as well. She, uh, she enters the, uh, the receipts. So we're transparent. Sure, sure. Um... Excellent. And what do you think overall is the goal with that, with, with Fruit Haven? What do you see this becoming? Yeah, hopefully uh, in the future, it's just a community of a neighborhood of, or multiple neighborhoods even with uh, people growing their fruit trees that are uh, friendly and good with each other and having uh, things, you know, events and fun activities and, and having an abundance of fruits, uh, easy access between each lot and yeah, hopefully peaceful and, and harmony, harmony kind of living together. Yeah, excellent, excellent. Um, you talked about obviously with the Canada Festival it made you 
feel like uh, being part of a community was important. How, how important has events been to you in terms of going to the the Canada Festival, Woodstock, the Amazon Fruit Fest as well now? How important do events are for helping people change their life and, and improve their uh, diet and their lifestyle? Those events, you mean like the festivals? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think they can be they can be very fun. For me, it was uh, always I wanted to volunteer. So every one of those events, like that I went to, I've always volunteered there because I see that uh, the people that come there as attendees, they often maybe they're not sure about the diet. Maybe they're still in the early stages. And for me, at that point, I was already um, I think for about two years or something. I was eating primarily fruits, and so I thought, well, if I'm going to go there, I want to be part of the staff and, and assist in making this festival good, because I have that experience of eating fruits, traveling, and and looking for the best fruits. And um, so, yeah, I think for people that uh, are still learning and want to learn more, the, the festivals are a really nice place to, to get a lot of information that maybe... I would have to go and like learn about it, watching a bunch of YouTube videos and then seeing like how to pick a ripe fruit. And, you know, in the festival, it's already there laid out. All the fruits should be usually ripe and good quality. Um, and there's other events that, uh, yeah, the activities that are fun, just mingling with other like-minded people. And what are other things that people do? I guess uh, the demos, yeah, like learning how to do these special recipes that that help in the transition. Uh, for some people, it might be a, a not just a transition, but a lifestyle of eating these kinds of raw gourmet food. But to me, it's something that I do on occasion. It's like a special treat, having like a, a cheat day where I have like a raw gourmet thing, uh, or a week where it's like a festival and there's a lot of raw gourmet stuff. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, yeah, uh, and we were at the Amazon Fruit Fest recently, and you were the activities manager. What's been your reflection on on the event? Yeah, I think most people liked it. Uh, I want to get more feedback. So far, there, um, one person gave me some feedback. But yeah, generally, uh, I just looked at how they did the previous uh, events, the previous years, and uh, based it on that. Um, yeah, I, um, that was the first time that I did activities management for this uh, festival or any festival. We've done lots of activities between our communities where we organize uh, potlucks and kind of visiting like caves or waterfalls, things like that. So uh, have some experience in scheduling those like, OK, well, we arrive at this time, we do this and that. and. So yeah, I have some notes as well on how to make the next festival. If I do the activities management, how to do them a, a better, more efficiently, more, uh, yeah, just better for the for the uh, staff, or rather for the uh, attendees, as well as the staff, like finding the balance that works for everybody. Yeah, great, great. Um, well, for people that, well, for people that might want to get in touch with you, follow you, um, interact with you in any way, how would they get in touch? Uh, yeah, basically I have uh, a few different ways. So Telegram is a good way and Facebook Messenger. Um, so my name, Boris Plotkin. I have also the YouTube and Instagram, Fruit Adventure Boris. Um, yeah, there's email as well, if anyone wants to use that. My Gmail is boris.plotkin at gmail.com. Excellent. Excellent. And uh, what are your own personal plans and dreams for the future? Uh, yeah, now I'm working on Fruit Haven 4. We've uh, got some more land over there that's on... Uh, yeah, I think we walked down that way when we went. And so I have a few lots there that I'm developing for my brother and and another friend. So yeah, I want to plant lots of fruit trees or very special varieties like the durians of different different um, species. You know, there's the the usual kind and then some other kinds and champadak and things that at this time we don't have much uh, 
fruiting yet. Actually, I don't think any have fruited in this region yet. So we got the special order from another nursery in Ecuador uh, that has all these special fruits and seeds and also they graft the plants. So it's gonna be very interesting. And, and yeah, maybe in the next, I don't know, five to 10 years when they actually start producing fruit, then it will be a very fun place to be. Excellent. Great. Well, thank you very much, Boris, for, for, for well. joining me today. And um, everyone that's watching, if you want to learn more about uh, Terra Frutis, Fruit Haven, you can easily find them online, actually, just by searching. But I think it's fruithaven.com, uh, terrafrutis.org. Fruithaven.org, yeah. Fruithaven.org, terrafrutis.com, yeah. From other way around, yeah. And the yeah. Amazon Fruit Festival, which is also amazonfruitfestival.com. So yes. check all of these things out and see if it's right for you. And um, you can go over and stay there for a little bit or you can volunteer or you can even look into buying land and all of that. And uh, um, you can speak to the, the people there to, to figure out more about that. So, um, and if you want to come to a festival, we have our festival in the UK, the UK Fruit Fest. It will take place this year from the 22nd to the 29th. Uh, of July 2022. Go to fruitfest.co.uk for more information about that and subscribe there to stay in touch and make sure you get all the updates from us. Thank you very much for joining. Boris, any last thoughts before we finish? Any last words of wisdom? Uh, well, yeah, if anyone's interested in uh, renting, checking out the place, often people come or volunteering as well. That's for me was the, the best way to learn uh, about permaculture, just being here, and uh, also you can do, of course, research online. There's so much information on the internet, so check out, yeah, think about what fruits you might enjoy. Having a community and support is a very good way to uh, live together, like minded people. So, yeah, hopefully, we have more communities in the area and expanding more people, buying more land. So. Excellent. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, everyone, for watching and listening. If you do enjoy this podcast and the interviews we're, we are doing, please help us out by sharing them with other people. If you've got any ad advice or feedback, you can, sh you can share that to info at fruitfest.co.uk. We're happy to hear any, any of your, your inquiries. Um, but definitely, if you, if you share this with anyone you think it might be relevant to, that would be very helpful. Thank you for watching and listening, and we will see you in another episode of the Love Fruit Podcast.